All right. Well, here we are again. And uh, this is the Journey of Integral Recovery podcast. And I'm still John Dupuy, last I looked. And uh, Dr. Bob Weathers is here. And our producer, co-everything, uh, Douglas Prater, mm-hmm. is also with us. And this is episode, correct me if I'm wrong, number 28, yeah? 30. Holy mackerel. Dreisig, as we say in German. Uh, that, that's amazing. So here we are. And uh, um, anyway, in this, in this ongoing thing, we were, you know, we're almost, um, almost scared to plan, pre-plan too much of what we're going to talk about. So we just start with a, um, a little, um, an idea, a German of, of an idea. And I think we were, we were talking, uh, we were, we were, we were before we, the camera turned on, we were talking uh, about a friend of ours is losing her dog, you know, and I like, I'm so connected with my dog. It's amazing. And, and how we actually deal with stuff. And one time, uh, you know, because life is faithful, you know, to give us just tragedy after, you know, shitstorm after shitstorm stuff happens. Right. And um, I wrote this blog one time, which I really liked. And it, the insight came to me when I was going through stuff, which I, <laughs> I am a lot. And uh, the, the idea was meditate like a rock. Okay. And I spent a lot of time out in these here mountains outside my window in, in northern Utah. And you find these rocks all over the place. You know, some of them are uh, different types of rocks, igneous rocks and, and pressure created rocks and all these different kinds of rocks. But you, these rocks, they're big old things. And they're sitting there on the ground. And I've slept next to them and hung out with them long enough. And, you know, they can get crapped on by a bird. They can get rained on, they can get snowed on, they can get frozen, they can get baked, they can be a part of one, they're just like, they're just a rock. And so I, what, what came to me in my experience, and another metaphor is meditate like a submarine, if you will. And, you know, on, on the surface, and, and to me when I meditate, it does seem like it's an archaeological dig. And I usually had to go through a lot of the same levels every time I started off. The chatty mind, this mind, the creative mind, this, that, the, oh, you suck mind, or, you know, or this, oh, my God, you know, I miss my parents so much, and blah, 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 blah. I'm going to go through all my personal history, and, you know, this is a dumb thing I did then, blah, blah, blah. Bloom. And then, oh, some really good ideas start coming through. And still, that's just another level, and then I have to get down to this deep level. And so, you know, if you're, th- you're thinking you're in a submarine and there's a tsunami coming or there, there's a hurricane or a storm or, you know, huge waves, and you're getting <laughs> if you're on the surface, if you go down, 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 and keep going down to, you know, what it is, two, three, four hundred meters, I mean, subs, they go really deep, you're just like, okay, you're just cruising. You know, and and that is that's one of the things that we develop with practice. I think is a a rootedness in the depths. Okay, that we can, you know, and you know, I'm a, I'm a passionate this neurotic blah 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 creative. Oh gosh, all of the, all the different aspects of myself, but at this deepest um, level, it, there is just a a goodness and a kindness and an acceptance. And, and a beauty of perfection. And when we tap into that, you know, it allows us to hold, you know, the pain and the tragedy and the losses and, and uh, uh, the hurts, or even worse sometimes, the hurt that we've done to others, you know. And it, it helps us to resolve that. And I, I think that every, uh, you know, truly transformative interior contemplative practice has to take us, you know, Often enough into that depth of ourselves so that we begin to, uh, it becomes more stable and we can hold the, the vagaries and the, and the comings and goings and the whole a process of life with, with perhaps with a lighter, more translucent, more loving, more compassionate, more accepting, deeply, deeply accepting uh, wisdom. I have this memory coming up just uh, right now. Uh, and I bet you all will have associations to this. Uh, I was thinking about it just the last few days. I was thinking about the experience of competing, uh, uh, which began kind of in earnest for me in high school, uh, in sports, in academic competitions, different things that I did. And I was remembering the felt sense of that uh, uh, in the last few days. And then just now as I was listening to you, John, I was remembering the last tennis tournament that I was in 
which was uh, 10 years ago now, my, uh, my, my poor right shoulder gave out after <laughs> decades and decades of abuse uh, with tennis and a couple of surgeries weren't able to correct it. So the last tennis tournament I was in, I won. And I can remember the finals of that tournament. I was back East uh, playing and um, I was up against an opponent who uh, uh, was far superior than, than I was. And that's not false humility. We were, you know, you rally, you warm up beforehand. Every stroke was just superior. Here's somebody who's extremely schooled. And I, I had played a lot of tennis, but most of my tennis playing was instinctive. It wasn't yeah. like, it wasn't like, this guy's like a ballet dancer. He was so right. good. And uh, I, I will never forget this experience. It's the only time this ever happened to me uh, over all the years and years of playing tennis. We were in the final and I was down. It was a two, you know, best of two sets. I lost the first set and I was down in the second set. And there's something about facing your limitations. And this is where competition comes up, where I'm over my head. I, I know I'm over my head. Mm -hmm. And there's almost like this place inside that drops. It was the image of the submarine, John. There's this place that drops inside. It's not dissimilar to what I've experienced over the years of just doing thousands and thousands of hours of counseling sessions as a therapist where you're just in the material that that is just incinerating material it's so uh it's so difficult so deep uh but i'm going to stick with the competition in fact i'll just stick with this tennis image is that what happened to me is i was looking at this guy and i realized i can't beat him on sheer physical ability he's gonna he's gonna hand my ass to me in about two games <laughs> And so I thought, how can I use my ingenuity? How can I? And it was going to require letting go of being intimidated, letting go of being afraid of everything, and just becoming, just kind of surrendering. And so you guys, I still remember, so I get the chills right now, I still remember it was an indoor, uh, it was in the wintertime up in, up in New England, and so it was indoor, the tennis court. I can still remember serving. It was right at the pivot point of this whole uh, thing, this whole match serving and all of a sudden everything dropped out there was no him there was no me there was no sound except for this i still remember there was a buzzing of the the lights way up on the high ceiling it's like an airplane hanger or whatever and it took got very quiet and then what it moved into was effortlessness and and i just there were no more unforced errors because most of my enforced errors were a function of anxiety. I just felt sure, so absolutely. overwhelmed by this guy's ability. And uh, I, won that, I won that game, and he started getting a little bit unnerved by that. It just got worse and worse for him. The upshot of this is that I turned it around, and I beat him. I won that, I won that tournament. And it was completely this experience of something. It was like the submarine and the tsunami. Up on the surface, man, that was a disaster, man. It was... And there was just something that clicked in, and I and I know that experience. I see both of you nodding. I know that experience, particularly in highly competitive situations over the years, where um, starting in high school, I would drop into a place that was unwilled. I couldn't conjure it consciously. Yeah. And out of that place, there was no more unforced errors. It was like if they beat me, they're going to beat me on their uh, on their ability. They're not going to beat me because I'm screwing up. And, and uh, in this case, this guy began to just kind of disintegrate because the, the energy shifted. You know, in our last podcast, we were talking about how when you get sober, it changes the interaction. I no longer was playing as a scaredy cat with this guy, and it started getting to him. It's like, no, this guy should be intimidated because I'm so much better than him. He, I, it changed. He, he, was, he could no longer have that position, and I began just kind of whittling away at him. <laughs> and it's one of the most uh, satisfying victories I've ever experienced in sports. And any example that I have experienced like that is of this same ilk. And it's something about the rock and the submarine, John. That's just what floated up as I was listening to you. <laughs> and, Can I ask and, you a question? Yeah, I have some questions too, but go ahead, Doug. Well, I, I, yeah, I have a interesting response to that but first i have a question for you which is what did you do after the tennis match it's interesting owing to the fact that the tennis match went on so long because now because i was down two sets and for anybody that knows oh, tennis wow. we had to play five sets 
And uh, uh, actually, let me, is that right? It was the best of five. Is that right? So it would be the yeah, it would be best of five sets. That's right. So I was down to, I'm trying to remember you guys. It's been a while. I think I had to win three sets. So we played five sets. It went so long that we had to extend it into the next day oh, wow. as fate would have it. And so we went home. We went home. And I, th I thought to myself, am I going to lose that overnight? And I came back and I had lost it. And so I came back into this kind of, Again, very kind of other space as I was playing him, just fluid motion. And I won, but there was no one there to witness it because the, the tournament had ended that night. And so we came back and we played. So it was just the two of us. And I, I, I can only answer you with this, Doug, as I remember walking away from him, I went up, shook his hand, and there was an odd interaction there because it, you know, it was clear that it pissed him off royally. As it turns out, he was the owner of the, uh, the, uh, the whole, what do you call it? A sports club. He was the owner of the whole sports club and I beat him. <laughs> and he was a collegiate player, which I'd never been. So it was, it was all wrong in every way. So there wasn't some like warm congratulations coming from him. And I was alone. There were no uh, spectators for that last, uh, the last set, whatever he played the last set. But I remember walking away and it etched itself in my mind that felt sense. So I've never forgotten it. And it's become the touchstone for any experience since then of how you can be delivered into a place of flow, something comes through and it's way, way beyond anything you could have controlled. So that's yeah. more how it went. It was more so, of a, kind of a private realization and kind of a concretization inside my bone memory. Bob, you just perfectly and beautifully illustrated exactly the things we have come to learn about the cycle of flow and how this works. You mm -hmm. started this tennis match in a place of struggle. You were yes. deep in the struggle things, <laughs> oh, yeah. thinking Perfect. way you know, too much about it and worrying yeah. about, I'm not going to beat this guy on just yeah. physicality and something else is going to happen. Well, what happened? You, you used the word surrender. We could also yeah. use the word fuck it. And I will lean into that later. <laughs> they call it in the cycles of flow, the, the release phase, but you struggle. You had this release phase where you just let go, you surrendered, and then you dipped into flow. You dipped into effortless yeah. and you sustained that for the match. Yeah. Yeah. You were, playing from a different place and otherworldly yes. experience. It was yes. beautiful. Yes. Afterwards, you rested. I mean, you were still in the middle of this match because you had to yeah. come back this day, but then right. the recovery right. phase, you right. perfectly went through <laughs> this entire cycle and beautifully illustrated what hmm. that can be. So that's, that's just so important to remember. Anytime we're trying to, to do that in, in any dimension of life, this can apply to interactions with people, giving a presentation on stage, doing your writing work or drumming, whatever it is, this, this cycle. And for me personally, I often stick around and struggle way too long and miss that release phase. But it's, you know, it's learning that surrender. It's learning to say fuck it that mm -hmm. allows you to drop into the flow. We, we yeah. talk about um, every le relapse being a case of the fuck it's. And mm -hmm. that to me suggests, and for a long time, I thought that that means not caring anymore. Like fuck it, I don't care. Mm -hmm. But I think that we say fuck it in that context when we care too much. We care too much about this feeling. And when you just surrender and say, whatever, I'm, I'm going to go with it. In the case of relapse prevention, it's I'm having a really hard time experiencing this emotion, this relationship, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. The fuck it is an acceptance. It's a surrender to it rather than a continuing to care so much that you can't handle it anymore. You release into a different place. It's a positive yeah. surrender, a positive fuck it. And we can use that as a tool to get into this much better, much healthier place. Mm. There's a book title in here. There's a book title in here. <laughs> you and positive fuck it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, there is a, a book. Thank you, Doug. There, there's a book about fuck it right now. And I haven't, I haven't really read it, but I've seen it as I, as I go through uh, my, my, all the, the vast amount of audible books that I, that I look at. Um, yeah, really, really interesting. And that's, you know, that's one of the things about, uh, sports. Um, I love sports. You know, I'm really interested in like uh, the, the running back for, you know, the Dallas Cowboy got expended, uh, suspended six games starting off. Oh, by the way, you can't beat your wife or whatever it was, you know, it's like, it, you know, it has to be, it has to be, you gotta, have, man, you gotta have a lot together. You have to work on yourself as a, as a ball player, as a tennis player, but as a human being too, you know, and we see the classic example of Tiger Woods. You know, he was like the hottest thing ever. And he just, 
blew it. He lost the inner game and he never got it back. Mm-mm. And now he, you know, you see pictures, he just got arrested and he's on pain medication. He looks, he, he just looks like an addict, you know, it's really, really sad. Yeah. So you have to, to keep that. And I think it's, um, really good in whether you're struggling with depression or you're struggling with addiction or some combination thereof anxiety to, to find something like, you know, sports and music or something you give yourself passionately to, because it's such an encounter with the self, you know, and I'm, I'm a real tennis freak. I love playing tennis. I play every chance I get and I go on YouTube and I learn about the grips and the tightness of the grips and the supination and blah, 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 forehand, backhand, slant, all this stuff. I just love it. I'm really nerdy. And, but when I, when I play, I went through a period recently where I was seeing so competitive. I was just an asshole. I would curse, you know, little kids, there's a church across the street. God damn it. You know, like John. And I got so disgusted with myself that I had to say, look, I'm not going to, if you can't behave better than that, you know, you're just going to have to stop playing. I'm, I'm serious, self. Knock it off. And, um, yeah, mm. I did. I got a lot mm. better. You know, and, and if I do, and if it does come out, you know, it's the positive kind. No, it's probably not. But I don't yell it anymore. <laughs> I give it to myself. And I go, okay, God forgive me. And, and I go on. And there is that surrender to, you know, I play with Pam. And, you know, we live here. There's no tennis players. And we have our own court, basically. Nobody else uses it. And we play and we play and, and we struggle and and it's gotten a lot better. I, I have a much more interior, prayerful game and I just surrender to it. You know, it's like, God, you know, I'm going to whack this thing, but this is a prayer and it can go into the net or it can go over the fence or whatever, you know, or it can, it's just, it's all, I'm just going for it. And I noticed, um, and usually, God, we are so competitive that one of us would lose. We just, we wouldn't talk all the way home. I mean, then we start laughing sometimes because it's hilarious. But I, I, last time I, I played with Pam, I won, you know. And, uh, and she came up and she was just smiling oh. at me. And I, I said, well, you know, after, I said, what happened? You, you won. And she said, I just got something. The switch came on. And I became so present. You know, and, you know, I throw the ball off, I feel the, the fibers of the fuzzy ball, you know, and you throw up and you see the clouds and you hit the ball and she just got into it. And at that point, it becomes a prayer, it becomes a yoga, you know, and winning and losing, which is really good because it's an encounter with yourself. I mean, how do you deal with losing? Has there ever been anybody that's batted a thousand and never lost, no matter how good they were? Never. I mean, you've got to deal with both. And, and you begin to hold that in a bigger context. And so I really recommend, you know, these athletic things for people to get into, you know, some, there are treatment centers now in the United States that deal with everybody becomes a marathon runner, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember James Taylor was talking about that. Mm-hmm. I think in the eighties when he was getting off heroin and alcohol and all this stuff, he ran like, you know, 12 miles a day. He said, man, I had such a bad habit. I had to run, mm-hmm. you know, and he says, I don't run that much anymore, but you can tell, I don't know, he must be at least 70 or something. And he looks good. And he, you just saw him, Bob. I, I, mm-hmm. I mean, he's playing as good as he ever has, you know. So to develop these, these kind of physical yoga, competitive, teaches you the deeper meaning of competition, what's the heart of sports, what's the heart of, of training yourself. And, of course, you know, you went into that flow state, which is like a total grace of you know, the universe, your last game became your most memorable game. But how many hundreds of hours, if not thousands of hours, had you put into learning your game till you got to the point where you could say, fuck it. And whoa, you know, just start coming through. I've got a little postscript to that story that you guys might appreciate. It just came to me as I was, as when I completely sharing that story, I remember my first tournament. <laughs> and my first tournament would have been in uh, uh, the fall of 1970 would be my first tournament. And as it turns out, I went into this tournament and my first match was against the number one seed in the tournament. And I was, this is my first, the beginnings of my competing as a tennis player. And it became clear to me that I was going to, uh, be completely obliterated by this guy. And, and again, that's just a reality. And so my, and I, I haven't thought about this ever in this framework. It was when I was listening to you, Doug, is that, so this is little Bobby Weathers, 15 years old. And I remember saying to myself, I'm not going to win. I'm not going to beat him. I'm not even going to win a game. 
that if I could even win a point off of him, that's how, good, that's how much better he was than me. If I can even win a point off of him, I'll consider that a victory. So we played two very quick sets. It was 6-0, 6-0. But I did win a few points, and I left that feeling pretty damn successful. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like a, getting in a, a slap fight with Bruce Lee. If you can have, <laughs> land one slap, you know. It's all relative, man. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a lowering of standards and changing your definition of what success means in a particular context that can be really valuable. Um, yeah, I as a person who who struggles with social interactions a lot of times, it is, and I thank my wife for suggesting this, but it becomes not how well did every single action at said party go, but did I show up to the party? Yeah, did I go? Was yes. I present? And yeah, allowing exactly. that to be a victory can be yeah, you just know, having powerful your enough. feet on the floor in that locale, you know, that can be a huge victory. Even if you don't say anything, you know, you, you showed up, you know, and maybe next time you'll say hello or whatever, you know. And, you know, John, you mentioned uh, the importance of a physical practice. And I think that's so important. It was so essential to my recovery too. And I have talked about starting small with these little walks around the block that grew a lot. I started lifting weights and doing some other things. Eventually I was deep into doing P90X and I went through around that, you know, that's, that's about an hour and a half every day, seven days a week, you're doing something. And I so finished nice. around to that. And then, you know, I did another one and I kept that up for a while. Actually, it really transformed my life because I was competing against, and this is something that I found incredibly value to uh, valuable as well, is that I was competing against yesterday's self. You know, I would take notes about exactly what I did and how much I was able to lift, how many push-ups I could do. And then the next day, the next time I did that workout, I would try to get just one more, just yeah. a little bit better than yesterday. And that's a right. valuable mindset too in, yeah. in recovery. Um, just a little bit better than I did it last time is oftentimes enough. I wanted to lean into something else here too. You talked about the struggle phase and the release phase. And I think that the release phase and the fuck it, I think that's mandatory. I think that we cannot stay in struggle forever. The release is going to come one way or another. And so learning how to allow that consciously is an incredibly valuable skill for us to cultivate as we go through this thing together. Because when we don't cultivate manually, when we're stuck in the struggle phase dealing with something, that's that's when the relapse happened because that's a release too. It's my state's going to change one way or the other. I'm going to get out of this struggle one way or the other. And so that can be in a healthy way or an unhealthy way. And it's up to us to desire and cultivate. And, you know, especially as our life in sobriety takes these unexpected twists and turns and life happens and difficult days happen, learning a healthy way to accept what we're going through and, and, use a positive fuck it to release in that good way acceptance of the emotions acceptance of the hardship and releasing into that and acceptance that deeper. for all your work and all your struggle you're really not in control moment to moment of how it's going to come out i mean you can set yourself up to be lucky more and more the more you practice but ultimately it's that moment of surrender and something bigger has to come through and and i'm really get excited about this subject because you know it's like i mean addiction is an overwhelmingly huge deal. I mean, it's a 24 seven cycle and it gets worse and worse and worse. So if you think, you know, you can half ass your way into sobriety, most of the time, well, you know, what it say in the big book, half measures of illness, nothing, you know, from, from kind of the source code of the modern uh, recovery movement. It really doesn't, you know, so, you know, get passionate, you know, it's like, for example, if you love your children, you passionately love your children, you're not going to come home drunk at night, okay? You're going to do whatever it takes so that doesn't happen. And if you find a passion for tennis or for physical expression or whatever, get something that you love more deeply, more, more truly, more nobly, more honorably than your freaking alcohol and drugs, you know, and commit yourself to that as a passion of self-discovery and, and re-engaging with the world and breaking the isolation and breaking the nihilism and breaking the depression and breaking the negativity and, and remaking yourself into uh, a version of yourself that is beyond, you know, beyond what you, you you're ever really imagined you could do. That's a really exciting story. And, and the feedback from that is authentic. 
Mm-hmm. All right. It's authentic happiness, it's authentic satisfaction, mm-hmm. real joy. And you can carry that with you. And you're still blessed by your last tennis game, you know? Mm-hmm. And I know, I, Bob, God bless you. I know how much you love tennis because we talk about it sometimes. Mm-hmm. And when I'm out there, lots of times I just say, God, you know, I can just, here I am, 61 years old, I can still play mm-hmm. tennis. I think I'm getting better, you know? But I started, mm-hmm. you know, I started my 30s. But uh, I'm still working on it and it's becoming better and deeper. And I'm learning more about myself and it's becoming more a yoga. I think I had to work through a lot of my adolescent woof woof (laughs) stuff till I could get to maybe a more mature, spiritual, you know, kinder way of being competitive as hell and trying my best, but not trying to crush my opponent, but trying to get into that dance of of, uh, non-duality and beauty that are in the flow states that we, you know, that we achieve through our, through our grunt and our grit and our passion. I'd I'd like to uh, come back to something that we were talking about earlier, uh, I really think it's, I really like it, Doug, and I feel like you're, uh, you're helping to kind of invent a language for it, talking about, it's like, who does fuck it serve? <laughs> you know, does, does this fuck it serve the ego, or does this, does this fuck it serve whatever, Jung would call it the self, you know, the greater self, and you can't tell by fuck it alone what it serves, you have to inquire a little bit further, um, I, I'll say this much, when I work with addicts and John, I think of all of your work uh, in, in wilderness uh, therapy, uh, in my work these days with typically male addicts in their 20s, uh, all of whom have been addicted to heroin or methamphetamine, uh, typically that's the, that's the drug of choice, a very severe long-term addiction, oftentimes since their uh, uh, early to mid-teens. And there'll be, a, there'll be there's in a group of 15 or 20 or 30 addicts, there'll generally be just a, a couple, three that really resonate with this, but it's, that's who I teach to, that's who I speak to. And they'll be the ones who see that the, the uh, incredible grace in having hit bottom. Um, and and uh, Doug, as I was listening to you talk about the flow cycle and that struggle phase, it brought to mind this experience, which is my own, but I think it's represented in these addicts who also, uh, they recognize it. It's kind of like a transmission of mind as a recognition. I remember when I was in the hospital a little over five years ago, detoxing from alcohol and drugs. I can remember in my haze, in my haze, even then I journaled just uh, uh, profusely. (laughs) I just was journaling day and night. And it was probably part of the mania of what I was coming off of, to be honest with you, but it served a process for me. And I remember journaling this. Uh, when I finished that treatment, by the way, I, I uh, actually burned my journal. I felt like I, it, it served what it did, and so I didn't keep my journal. I've had different feelings about that, but it's interesting that all of these words, I thought I need to, I need to now live this. And so I didn't hang on to the journal. But I remember journaling it, and I remembered the feeling of this is that in the midst of this, and I've shared this here before, I believe, and certainly in conversations with you, John, is that there was some immense, trying to find the word for it, there was like an anticipatory nostalgia. And that is, I I felt, even while I was in the hospital, in the dregs, I was surrounded by addicts half my age, most of whom had been addicted to heroin and methamphetamine, and uh, I felt like a fish out of water. And I think in some ways they saw me as a fish out of water. I was absolutely sincerely there. And I remember feeling this sense that I'm going to look back on this time of clearing or what you called release, Doug. I'm going to look back on this with tremendous longing, with tremendous nostalgia. There's something so clarified here. It's a little bit like the tennis match times a million. Um, which is that I can't do this on my own. I've clearly reached the end of my uh, abilities, and whatever carries me from this henceforth is going to begin out of emptiness, out of radical emptying. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth. I oftentimes look back on that because what happens, even in recovery, even in the most sincere recovery, is that there's the gradual kind of re-accretion of ego stuff. And there was a place in which it was completely emptied out, as in the tennis match. And what came through there uh, was transformative. Whether it, whether it transformed me to win a tennis match or transformed me to change my life, I realized that it required a complete annihilation of the old. And it was a royal fuck it of all time to me. I remember everything was fucked. My career, my relationships, my life. 
all of them were fucked. And somehow in that fucked place, I've never experienced this before or since, there was absolute liberation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's a really interesting observation that this could happen at different scales too. You know, yes. there's, yeah. there's this process yeah. happening on a yeah. day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. And then within larger cycles of our lives, a couple of months, um, even, even many years or decades, this, this cycle Mm-hmm. occurs and some of those releases can be tremendously powerful um mm-hmm. you you talk about the gradual rebuilding of the ego reaccretion of the ego he used the word i believe and uh that's why the daily work is so important too to continue to do this and even with the most robust daily practice imaginable you're never going to prevent all that entirely these these larger scale no, that's the clearings. that's the, actually the practice yeah <laughs> it's dealing with us uh, it is but yeah yeah these these larger scale um periods too of of releasing the stuff that is built up over the weeks months years are absolutely critical that's why you know, taking taking some time away from work for a vacation, for example, is so important. So you can get out of that space and give yourself the opportunity to release that by doing something different, something transformative, and start afresh into a new cycle of your life. Um, it occurs, provides that yeah, it occurs. It occurs to me that the clients that I referred to earlier, the handful in a in a in a larger group that get the truth of what you're saying right now, Doug, what we're talking about is that those are the ones that I have the most hope for. Their fuck it is informed by this kind of letting go into, and the rest of the room would line up and say, fuck it, but their fuck it's in service of something different. (laughs) Yeah. Well, in my book, I said, every relapse begins with, uh, with a case of the fuck it. Now every recovery process begins with a case of the fuck it's, Yes. You know, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, and I want to say, Bob, about your experience, you know, it's like you had, you truly had a, a, a classic mystical experience in the hospital or Buddha mm-hmm. nature. You were totally mm-hmm. detached and all your, you know, your license, mm-hmm. your reputation, your career, your blah, 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 all the stuff you built. It, so all of a sudden was gone mm-hmm. and it was okay. And it was like, oh my God, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, so oftentimes by the grace of the, of the universe or the way we're, we're set up or something, we'll get these previews, you know, we'll get these huge, beautiful states that we can actually become a touchstone. But then we have to go back and start cleaning up and doing the hard, you know, day-to-day work and, and working with all that stuff. But man, we're free. We felt it. We felt what it was like. But, oh yeah. If I weren't such a damn slave to my drugs, to my ego, to my expectation, to my shame, to my this, to my that, whatever it might be, you know, I'd be a free man. And how's freedom feel? Freedom feels. Oh, so beautiful. You know, it's my true self. Welcome home, Bob, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and and then, and then of course, you, you – and I've watched you over the last few years to yeah, yeah. do the, the hard, hard work. I mean, you know, you really work. Yeah, and yeah. it's beautiful to, to, to watch you go through the process and yeah. certainly inspires me. I count it as such a gift, John. I'm looking right at you right now and tears in my eyes of having you accompany these last five years in terms of what does this look like then in terms of bringing this mystical experience into the world and incarnating it in the day-to-day, the mundane, the washing of the dishes. And, and John, you've been my central support and inspiration through this. You've helped to inspire me to regular practice. You model it yourself. You write about it. You speak about it. You, 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 you embody grit. And whatever part I've gotten of that uh, from you has been instrumental to my continuing to live that. I don't feel disconnected from that mystical experience. I don't have it in pure form. It's like a Kundalini awakening. Yeah. I don't have it in pure form, but it's it's always there. In fact, I get right. tastes of it in this yeah. morning's meditation. I was meditating this morning, Doug, listening to your track, Stealing Flow. And I get intimations of what I felt completely five years ago. Well, and, I got a uh, taste of it just now. You talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you, yeah, no, we we met somebody. You you made a uh, a video, and um, they said, "Hey, somebody's reviewing your book," and he says, "You're not a complete idiot." I went, "Really?" <laughs> Check that out. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thanks for noticing. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I'm an example. I'm an example of how it is that that theory alone is not sufficient. You know, uh, we've talked about this here in different contexts, but I started in the 
the late 80s, early 90s, practicing what ends up being called integral uh, life practice. I it just uh, out of my studying of Wilburn, it got it got uh, it got taken to a new level when you when you release Sex Ecology, that book. But but even uh, beginning late days, I can still remember because I can place it where I lived and was working professionally. I'd be running on the beach going through this kind of cartography in my mind of what it is that we do now in terms of quadrants and levels and lines. And uh, all, I was doing some proto version of that that was my own. And it didn't keep me from becoming addicted. I actually became addicted well into very regular discipline practice. That's never been an issue for me, but it wasn't sufficient. And so when I, when I did get into recovery uh, 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 with, with, uh, real earnestness, I began looking immediately, and you know this story, John, I began looking uh, uh, to see who else is doing this, basically applying what I had done, but now applying it to recovery. And you know, because you know that there was that one article that was out of uh, UCSF, out of San Francisco, I read one article, and I thought, well, that's a start. <coughs> and then within a few days or a few weeks, I, you your book hadn't come out yet. It was announced that it was coming out. And I can't remember if I reached out. To, no, I don't think I reached out to you then, but I, 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 I wrote to State University of New York, said, I want the first copy of that book when it comes out. Oh, wow. And it was, it was just the timing, the convergence. It was exactly at the time that I was going into recovery. And so from the very beginning, you were a foundation. Immediately, I went online and I did a review of your book owing to the university work I was doing. And then thankfully, Guy... Guy saw that, connected me to you, and we met within a few months after that in Boulder, uh, here in Ken Wilbur. Uh, that was at the fourth turning conference, and from there it's just gone on. But from from the very beginning, even before your book came out, I had uh, I had this strong yen for exactly somebody's doing what you were doing, and uh, that's a central gratitude of not only the healing that's come, but also just one of the benefits of my getting into recovery is I get to meet and, and be as close to John Dupuy as I feel. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, I wanna say, and I, I've said that to, to, to students too, that you know, recovery is cumulative, you know, and they say that, that people usually relapse you know, four or five, six, seven times before they finally get it. And I've, you know, I've worked with people who relapse and they just feel crushed and everything. So well, everything you learn before that, it didn't go away. That's that's a yeah. That's what you you know you dust off this latest fall on your face. Oh, welcome to humanity. You're not perfect, and you know get going. And just like your 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 understanding of, of integral theory, and I've worked with a lot of people both integrally informed and not. I get a lot of integrally informed people because I wrote a book called Integral Recovery. But I find you know they they're just as prone to have these you know addictions and compulsive disorders as anybody else. But having that integral understanding really makes it. It's, it's a big leg up, really, really helpful and in, in putting it all together and, and understanding yourself and looking at what needs to be looked at and including it. So it's, it's uh, yeah, I can't. You know, we had Robert Augustus Masters on here just a few podcasts ago, and he he's written that seminal book on spiritual bypassing. And my initial exposure to spiritual bypassing was back in the early 80s with John Wellwood's writing about that. And, and it's very much continuum between them. But I'm like at Exhibit A in terms of spiritual bypassing. And uh, uh, beautifully, the integral model, I think, among other things, helps provide an antidote to spiritual bypassing. Yep. Insofar as I'm being faithful, to the quadrants and all the lines within the quadrants, it gets harder and harder to justify bypassing my body, bypassing my spirit, bypassing my creativity. It's not optional in an integral recovery practice, and the model is 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 the healing. It seems like to me, it keeps me honest. And the acknowledgement of the shadow. Yes, you know, thank both, you. Both yeah. the light shadow and yeah. the dark shadow, like Doug yeah. is so yeah. brilliantly manifesting right now. Yeah. He's got this yeah. beautiful luminant face coming out of the darkness. It's like, <laughs> I you're, am you're, I am the shadow. I, I am the shadow. <laughs> I am the good dragon. <laughs> I am the evil dragon. <laughs> the shadow knows. Nah. But you know, I mean, and all of that stuff, if you don't acknowledge that kind of unconscious weird stuff, you know, yeah. man, everything can be derailed. You know, it really, at some level, you have to, you have to do the work. And, uh, and again, Ken's book, he was saying, you know, real spiritual maturation does not really happen, you know, going through these higher levels without meditation, without interior practice, you know, and it's like, you can go, oh, what, no, uh, mm, yeah, you think about it, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> you try to think of the exception. I don't know. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, uh, there it is. So the work, the work, the joy. The horror, as you're saying, the Brando thing. Early. Yeah, it's, it's that too. And sometimes we have to embrace the suck. Things, things aren't always going to be pleasant, and, and that's okay. We embrace it. We lean into it. Um, you've, you've got a whole series of books coming out now. Yeah. You know, yeah. Embrace, personal, personal embrace the suck. Yeah. Embrace the suck. I, I, think there's a, I think there's a cottage industry developing here, Doug. You know, it, yeah. In, in truth, though, there, there's some real power in, in acknowledging that things aren't perfect and that's okay. I'm in pain right now and that's okay. You just lean into it. You embrace it. You allow yourself to, to feel those things. You allow yourself to be where you are. You've lost things in your life. You've done some damage and you just embrace how much that hurts. You, you accept it. And there's power in that because that, that catalyzes the release that allows you to move beyond it. You know, yeah. and, and when I, I, you know, I still struggle with depression and I, you know, I, I've been working with it the last couple of weeks. I've just been meditating two hours a day and I've been working out and, you know, going out with my dog and connecting with folks, probably not as much as I should, but, but yeah. And, and one of the things is that, oh, you, John, you wrote this book and you've been practicing for 12 years. You shouldn't have a bad day. You know, you shouldn't be right in the middle of the soup again, you know, and that judgment that there's something wrong with feeling pain you know, and it's just not useful, you know, and, and, it, and it's like, it's like the universe saying, okay, you can, you can, uh, cause pain's been my biggest teacher. I mean, there's no question that, I mean, as far as an interior level, and I've had exterior teachers too. I mean, in all dimensions of life, but on the interior, it hasn't been the bliss, maybe 60, 40, but it's probably the suffering that's done more towards, you know, my actual growth than uh you know the you know the the non dual static states uh that's kind of hard to say but i i would i would probably safely say that yeah to bring it back to your opening metaphor john of the submarine the surface is calm but that doesn't mean the submarine's not going way down here facing all kinds of obstacles in its path that's right i have this yeah. image of, of our creating a, a integral recovery t-shirt and doug uh, because of your graphic intelligence that we have some really cool design of embrace the suck. And, <laughs> and I say that hugely tongue in cheek, but the, the occurs to me in both our conversation about, about embracing the suck as well as reinvestigating fuck it's, it's like it, in, both, in both cases, a submarine image is apt is that at a surface level, there are plenty of people that embrace the suck and identify with the suck and their lives fucking suck. That's really their, their identity is in the suffering. But we're talking about taking the submarine down back to you, John, and embracing the suck at a deep level can be transformative. The very same thing with the fuckets. Plenty of people have fuckets. I certainly know about fuckets at the surface level. And that, uh, th as you say, John, that's the prelude to, re to, to relapse. But uh, I was really illuminated, Doug, by your exploration of fuckets from this deeper level of a, a fucket as release or as surrender. It's like, that's mandatory for what we're talking about in terms of recovering our true selves. Well, yeah, yeah, it's like what came to the vision I had is like you're standing mm -hmm. by the river, the icy river, and the little kid fell on the river and it's mm -hmm. flowing. And you go, but my life, my kids, and everything. And mm -hmm. you know you got to go in after that kid. And you just say, mm -hmm. fuck it. Yeah. You know, yes. you just throw yourself and you yeah. throw yourself in the river and, that's you know, perfect. sink or swim. Yeah. I got to try to save that kid, you know. That's perfect. And that's just yeah. it, you know. Yeah, that, that is just it right there. There's this idea in creativity theory that the essence of creativity is homospatial process. The idea of homospatial process is where you bring the three musketeers into one space and then see what gets generated. It's really extraordinary, isn't it? Wow, you guys. <laughs> and we often, before we get the camera rolling here, we're going, well, what are we going to talk about? And I'm like so scared to have any really set idea. You know, I love so, that. Well, well, I love that. Let's, you know. <laughs> it must be it must be hell on you because I mean you're an academic most of your career and I know I've I've done a little bit of academic you do have to prepare lectures and plans and stuff like this but it's not quite the way we do business so well, I, have the, I, I have the image before we start of Jim taking Doug and I to the edge of a diving platform that's you know three stories up and just pushing us off <laughs> you just push us off. <laughs> 
Oh, you know, there's an interesting lesson about that kind of coaching. You know, we built a doggy door for Lucy, you know, on the front door, mm -hmm. and it's got, you know, it's got magnets, you know, so it stays stuck, and it's kind of clicky. She doesn't like anything clicky. And it's like, I would try to entice her with steaks and everything. She's like, ain't going through the door. <laughs> and so we had this uh, friend, and he just pushed her butt through the door, blam, she's like, <laughs> and he did it a couple other times, and blam, she's like, Okay, <laughs> I can do this. And now it's like one of the, the biggest advantages we've had of having an indoor outside dog, you know, without her, roar, 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 come in. Just boom, boom, boom. So anyway, yeah, sometimes we need that just, you know, um, that push in, into the abyss of our own. Uh, I can't do this or whatever, you know, and that's what good coaches can do. And, and uh, uh, we can do for each other, you know, because yeah. we all have times when we're up, we have times when we're down and, this, you know, we just need to be able to switch hats as needed, yeah. you know. All right. Well, anyway, thank you guys, uh, our ever-growing uh, uh, number of people that are downloading this. And uh, we're also working on a, uh, with Doug, uh, we're working, uh, Bob and Doug are, are creating a forgiveness meditation mm -hmm. with uh, entrainment. Uh, Doug doing the entrainment music and Bob reading and doing the, uh, uh, the, the forgiveness. And hopefully that'll be ready when, guys? I uh, don't have a date yet. Actually, I'd like to talk with you about it a little bit after we wrap here. Okay, awesome. And also, Doug and I are working on uh, creating the the audio version of the Integral Recovery book. So uh, that'll be fun. And I'm I'm, I'm a huge consumer of audio books these days, yeah, me too. and uh, really help. Then if I find one that's like it ain't enough just to listen to it, then I'll buy a hard copy so I can mark it all up and stuff like that. But I think. Uh, it should be uh, it should be pretty good, and Doug will be reading most of it. And as you guys can see, I uh, can see you can see he has a good voice. Now you can hear that he has uh, a good professional, beautiful uh, intonation and the whole thing. So anyway, that's coming up. Please, if you haven't downloaded the Deep um, Delta Recovery thing, that is one of our favorites. You know, and I'm always putting it into the mix, and I mix and match uh, the, these. Um, the many, many tracks that we've created, but that is really a great one. We'll get you into uh, just, just be quiet and just sense into it and watch what happens and feel what happens. Okay. And you'll start meditating really deeply in four or five minutes. And it's amazing. So anyway, that's it. Hey, thank you. Thank, thank you, Doug. Thank you, Bob. And thank, thank you everybody out there. Always Appreciate you so much. Okay. God bless. Okay. Okay.